All right. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the March 2023 Interreach webinar. Um, we are so happy to have you. Uh, and in a second, I'll ask my co-chair, Christine, if she has any um, any announcements before we get started. Um, but we're really happy today um, to introduce our speaker, who's Dr. Quinn Spadola. Um, many of you probably saw in the announcement that went out, but um, to make sure uh, that everyone sees it, who's watching it from our archives, um, I will share with you here that Dr. Spadola is the Deputy Director of the um, NNCO, which is the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. Um, she's motivated by a desire to broaden participation in the STEM workforce and sees nanotechnology as a powerful tool to engage and excite future professionals, as well as to bring people together across a bunch of different boundaries, including agency representatives, academics, members of uh, industry, and others to tackle challenges like climate change, pandemic preparedness, and all the things that unfortunately we have an endless list of um, giant societal challenges. Um, so uh, I think that we'll hear more about Dr. Spadola's background um, during her talk, but she has a, a really interesting um, background in education as the um, uh, Director of Education and Outreach for the Southeastern Nanotechnology Infrastructure Corridor NNCI site. Um, at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Um, she began her time at the NNCO as a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow, um, which is a fantastic way to span a bunch of boundaries and, and learn to spin all the plates. Um, and after her fellowship, she served as um, Education and Outreach Coordinator and Technical Advisor to the Director um, until 2018. Um, and then uh, this is all kind of based on a foundation of a PhD in physics from Arizona State University and a Master of Fine Arts in Science and Natural History Filmmaking from Montana State University. So I think all of us would be happy if the rest of the talk was just hearing her life story. Um, but we, uh, we are also excited to be about to hear uh, from her on whole number of things about boundary spanning. So before I do pass it off to Dr. Spadola, um, I just wanted to ask Christine or other community members, do you have any um, announcements that you want to get in before we spend the rest of the hour with Quinn? Not for me, just really um, excited about Quinn's talk and um, happy to see so many familiar faces on the call. Yes, it's really great to be back together. Okay, so with that, Dr. Spadola, um, take it away and thank you very much for being here. Thank you. And um, I don't talk too much about myself in this. Uh, can everybody see my slides okay? Good, all right, excellent. I talk mostly about the NNCO and the NNI, but happy to answer any questions. Uh, actually, this month for Women's History Month, the office, the NNCO is having an activity where we've invited female nanoscientists, nano engineers, and nano entrepreneurs to uh, join classrooms virtually across the United States to share our career paths and also how we use nanotechnology to uh, solve problems. And I've gotten to speak to a couple of classrooms already. And I think it surprises students when they see I have physics and filmmaking as a, as a background. So I'm really happy. I'm going to start this uh, with not an apology, but a little bit of an explanation. I'm really happy to step in and talk to all of you today about the NNI and the NNCO. Um, uh, the former director of the NNCO had originally agreed to do this and she nominated and suggested me to uh, take over. And I'm glad that I get to talk to your group today because uh, spanning boundaries is certainly something that I have strived to do over my entire professional career. And to uh, start off with, I'm going to give you all a little background on what the NNI and the NNCO are, all those N acronyms, and then talk through a couple of examples from uh, what the office does that uh, how we bridge so many different areas of expertise and government agencies and missions and stakeholders in order to make progress in nanoscale science and engineering. So to start with, just to give you an idea of, of nanotechnology and how very broad it is uh, to help motivate everything else. So nanotechnology pretty much sits at the interface of 
every science and just about every engineering uh, discipline. Uh, for example, you can pull out a nanotechnology paper and it might have 45 art authors from eight different disciplines. And um, over the last 20 years, since the start of the NNI, uh, nanotechnology has really matured from a field that was focusing in on the nanoscale and controlling at the nanoscale and miniaturizing to being defined by much more rational design and manipulation of those nanoscale objects. And this slide just gives you a handful of the different areas that working at the nanoscale has really made an impact. Uh, it really shows a breadth of the research portfolio within the National Nanotechnology in Initiative. Uh, nanotechnology has made it to space. It has it helps to address infectious diseases. The COVID-19, the Moderna and Pfizer mRNA vaccines were definitely nano-enabled, as well as progress towards a universal flu vaccine one day. Alternative energy like solar cells and even hydrophobic coatings on wind turbines and smart glass to you know, allow in the visible light, but keep out the IR in the summertime, for example. Advanced concrete, which is really fascinating. Uh, I think concrete is actually a really interesting area. Anti-corrosion coatings, which really speaks to resilience, especially in terms of climate change. Embedded sensors for smart roads, for water treatment, for water purification, for uh, precision agriculture and, and food. Uh, consumer electronics, we all have a smartphone in our pocket, uh, as well as any kind of sensors that are going in and being developed for prosthetics and even artificial muscles. So just a huge breadth of areas that are impacted by nanotechnology. And in recognition of that, uh, the NNI was developed, the National Nanotechnology Initiative, and it kind of covers everything nano across the federal government because it acknowledges that so many different agencies and missions are uh, that nanotechnology, excuse me, spans so many multiple agencies and missions. And the NNI was actually launched and announced by President Clinton in 2000 and was signed into law by President Bush in 2003 through the 21st Century Nanotechnology R&D Act. Uh, so we like to say that the NNI has enjoyed bipartisan support over the years. And I wanted to point out that when Clinton announced the National Nanotechnology Initiative in 2000, he acknowledged that the initiative was there to strengthen scientific disciplines and create critical interdisciplinary opportunities. So from the birth of the NNI, it was all about creating this interdisciplinary uh, community around working at the nanoscale. As far as our office, here are all of the various bridges that connect the NNCO across the federal government. The NNI is coordinated under the auspices of the White House National Science and Technology Council, the NSTC. And uh, the formal organization structure includes the Nanoscale Science, Engineering, and Technology NSET subcommittee of the NSTC. And uh, the, NS, the NSET is made up of agency representatives from 30 plus different federal agencies. And under the NSET is the Nanotechnology Environmental and Health Implications, the NEHI Working Group, as well as where I am as Deputy Director, the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. And the NSET subcommittee is co-chaired by two representatives from two different agencies. Right now, it's someone from the DOD and someone from the Department of Energy as well as someone from the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, currently, it is our new NNCO director, Brandon Bruff. Traditionally, it has either been the director of the NNCO or it might be someone from OSTP. And by law, that law that Bush signed, uh, the NNCO is reviewed by the National Nanotechnology Advisory Panel, which is basically, uh, which has been interpreted as the PCAS, the President's Council Advisors for Science and Technology, as well as the National Academies review us too. And over the 20 plus years that the NNI has kind of existed as this idea and as this initiative, uh, it's really evolved as a result of those two external bodies reviewing the activities of the NNI. So that's the formal bridges that connect us to various activities across the federal government. And this is a, uh, I chart of all of the different agencies that I've mentioned that are part of the NNI. 
Uh, the nanotechnology research and development in the US is conducted under the uh, NNI, and it is a collaborative R&D initiative to, under, under, to advance the understanding and control of matter at the nanoscale. For national economic benefit, national security, and for an improved quality of life. As I said, uh, it was announced by Clinton, signed into law by Bush, and part of that law each year, our office cre creates a report to Congress that we call the President's uh, Budget Supplement, or the NNI Supplement to the President's Budget. Uh, the 2023 Budget Supplement was just released, and we are already working on the 2024 one. Uh, and so each year, Congress receives a report on the activities of all these various agencies involving nanotechnology. We are not a uh, funding agency or funding mechanism in any way. We do not have any money. Uh, we primarily survive through soft power, through the power of convening mostly. But to give you a scale of what the federal government has invested in nanotechnology, the 2023 budget request was uh, $1.9 billion across all these various agencies. And since 2001, the overall investment in nanotechnology has been over uh, $40 billion. And that includes the 2023 uh, request. And you can find the budget supplement if you're curious on nano.gov. And uh, let's see. And then, so these are a number of the agencies you can see on my slide that are involved in the NNI, and they continue to grow uh, as we add more agencies, as nanotechnology affects more and more areas. Um, let's see, as I mentioned, they agencies really participate based on their interests and their mission space. So we have everything from basic research, NSF, to the Department of Energy and the DOD, which is much more mission specific. Regulatory agencies are here as well, and um, other agencies with, uh, well, let's see. So they there's about 33 now that work together, and I wanted to include the vision statement for the NNI on this screen. And it says, uh, the vision of the NNI is a future in which the ability to understand and control matter at the nanoscale leads to ongoing revolutions in technology and industry that benefits society. And there are five goals of the NNI to help advance uh, this vision statement. And that's actually, oh, and I have one more slide about us before I get to some examples. And this slide is an overview of the tools that we do have in order to build the bridges we need to uh, across so many different stakeholders. As I said, we don't have money. Uh, what we have is a uh, convening power as well as the mandate to communicate about nanotechnology, both within the federal uh, community and the broader community. There are actually only a few coordinating offices in the federal government. Um, the Global Change, which was started in the late 80s about climate change, and it was actually started by Reagan, so uh, long ago. There's an IT coordinating office, which was started in the mid 90s. There is the NNI started in 2000, and then Quantum uh, got their own coordinating office in, I believe, 2018. And um, I don't know if AI is considered to have its own. There are definitely people who are coordinating efforts around AI, but I don't believe there is a law yet, but don't quote me on it, to create a specific coordinating office. Interestingly, the NNI is one of the few coordinating offices with that mandate for public communication and outreach, uh, which allows us to do a lot more bridge building beyond the federal government. Um, it is one of the uh, aspects of the law that uh, we follow as, as the NNCO to uh, coordinate the NNI. Let's see, our office facilitates these collaborations among the agencies as well as providing the technical and administrative support for that NSET subcommittee. Uh, we, we are the ones who prepare that president's supplement to the, to, uh, excuse me, the supplement to the president's budget each year. So we provide that information to Congress. We also promote commercialization of nanotechnology. It is one of the major goals of the NNI. 
We have a staff member who's devoted to being an industry liaison, so creating that connection to uh, industry, and we share best practices through podcasts, webinars, workshops, focused on the needs of the business community. As I said, we are responsible for public outreach and public engagement for the NNI, uh, which we do through a, dump, a bunch of different mechanisms. We maintain the nano.gov webpage. We host those workshops. A lot of different podcast series that are out there, uh, you know, to talk to both experts, but to also explain uh, different areas of nanotechnology to a more general audience. And we facilitate a number of networks and communities of interest. And then um, the review, which is also part of the law, so that each few years we provide information and uh, suggestions of speakers as PCAST and the academies review us and we learn from what they have to say about our efforts. Okay, so that was a overview of where I am and what we do and what tools we have to build some bridges. Now I'm gonna talk through a couple of examples of the different communities that we have to uh, connect while we uh, work at the NNCO. So every five years, the NNCO needs to develop a strategic plan. And that plan provides the framework under which individual agencies can conduct their mission-specific nanotechnology programs. And uh, they coordinate these activities amongst them, you know, the different agencies through kind of the activities that we help to convene and organize. The strategic plan brings together members of all of these different federal agencies as well as input from the general public. So for the most recent strategic plan, which was issued or was released to the public in October of 2021, uh, the way, and, and I pulled up the uh, kind of like the author page from the strategic plan here, it's the center panel, uh, just to show you how many different voices and perspectives and missions were represented across the federal government all those acronyms after everyone's names that were pulled in and helped to develop this uh, strategic planning document. And I wasn't around while this was being developed in 2021. I was down at Georgia Tech at the time, but the way that the office developed a document with so many different uh, perspectives was by creating uh, five strategic planning teams that were primarily fed, that were feds first, and then those uh, federal members, they developed RFI content, request for information content. They identified speakers from outside the federal government. They built panels and uh, discussion topics for public workshops. And I wanted to go through some of the examples from the RFI that was released to show the types of questions that we were, that the office was trying to address through public comment that they really wanted to hear from a broader community about. And they broke down the RFI into three kind of main areas. One was mechanism, which was how does the NNI operate? How do we reach out to and build these bridges? And one of the questions they asked is, what key elements and intersections are necessary to form an agile framework that will enable response to new developments along the nanotechnology continuum from discovery and design to development and deployment? So really, how do we create and move quickly, respond to all of those different communities, to all those in different intersections? And we wanted to hear some examples from everyone uh, related to the NNI community, not just how the feds think that it should be done. And the second area was communication, going back to that point that we have that mandate. And uh, the question they asked was, how can the NNCO facilitate communication and collaboration throughout the nanotechnology R&D ecosystem to enhance research and ultimately commercialization? And how can the NNI and NCO best communicate opportunities, resources, and advancements to the community? How can the NNCO best engage with the stakeholder community to understand their advancements and needs? And then the last area for the RFI was around topic areas. How does nanotechnology support other foundational fields and initiatives? And what future technical topics are likely to emerge from advancements in nanotechnology? So this document had input from the agencies, 
had input for the general public. There was, and from various communities in the nanotechnology ecosystem. Uh, the authors also looked at advice from PCAST and or recommendations from PCAST and the academies. And there were public workshops and conferences in order to pull all of this information together to create this updated 2021 strategy. And the um, part of the new strategy, the NNI determined that the overarching goals to support nanotechnology research and development, commercialization, infrastructure, and responsible development should remain. Uh, but they also decided that there needed to be a new standalone goal around engaging the public and expanding nanotechnology workforce. So that was a change with the um, latest strategic plan. And I have a slide dedicated to how we do that. So I wanted to make sure that uh, I pulled that out and highlighted that that was a change with the 2021 stra uh, strategic plan. As well as updating these goals, uh, there was a new mechanism added called National Nanotechnology Challenges. And that was how we we're trying to address that need to be agile and to uh, address priorities. So my uh, next kind of case study and how we build these bridges is around our first National Nanotechnology Challenge, which is called Nano for Earth, which was announced in October of uh, this year, 2022. I don't know how many of you on the call know this, but there is such a thing as National Nanotechnology Day, and that's October 9th for 10 to the minus nine for the nanoscale. So that's why so many big announcements seem to happen in October, because we time them with our celebration for National Nanotechnology Day. And I wish there was a dessert theme that we could do with it, because I think pie day is so popular because of pie. So we need to come up with a, a nano dessert but not a small dessert. All right, so in developing these national nanotechnology challenges, I just wanna make sure it is clear that they are not providing funding. A lot of people seem to connect challenge with a funding opportunity. And again, that's not what this office does. Uh, the expectation for creating these challenges is to um, focus on a significant global problem facing society where nanotechnology can be a part of the solution. And the collective efforts of all of those various NNI communities, including federal funding agencies, will more quickly, quickly lead to uh, solutions. And the way that a challenge topic is selected is through a number of iterations and a number of conversations, both internally and externally. And climate change, which is the focus of the first challenge, that was something that came out of that RFI that was uh, the information that was collected to create the strategic plan. And the topic has a lot of uh, requirements to it. It needs to be broad enough to be relevant to a significant number of NNI member agencies. It needs to align with the priorities of the administration. It has to have a sense of urgency in order to engage broader stakeholders beyond the US government. And it also has to be an area where there are real near-term opportunities to uh, use nanotechnology to impact uh, some kind of solution or move a solution forward. So when trying to come up with a topic, all these different criteria need to be met in order to really capture a, an idea that will motivate people beyond just the federal government. We really, something that motivates those, that bridge building. And so we uh, started with, so the first one is Nano for Earth, which is around climate change. And I love the image that was developed by the internal federal team that started to scope this uh, challenge. And it shows, you know, that all the different areas that nanotechnology can have an impact in, uh, in, in, combat, in addressing climate change. And so I mentioned that there was an internal federal team that scoped the challenge, but in no way determined the full idea of the challenge. They are not responsible for developing the metrics to measure its uh, success. We made the challenge public so that we could engage a public, a broader NNI community in order to determine where the best places, where should we shine the brightest lights in nanotechnology addressing climate change. And so we all had a public workshop 
in January. It was our, our first two day public workshop about nano for earth and there will be many other activities, uh, but this was the one where we did we talked about where are the areas that are ripe for uh, moving them just over the line into a application that can be used by end users. We talked about what type of metrics we should be looking at to measure the success of a challenge. And we concentrated a lot on uh, workforce and issues of sustainability. We had a had one panel with a, a school teacher. Uh, well, actually, now she she used to be a school teacher. Now she helps develop climate uh, change relevant curriculum for the state of California, as well as someone uh, who is uh, interested in the sustainability around nanotechnology, trying to bring all those diverse perspectives together. We had about 400 people attend. It was hybrid, and there were about 60 in the room. You can see the picture all very responsibly staggered uh, around the room as we had our public workshop. And there will be more activities as we move forward with our challenge, but really trying to come up with a topic that can help facilitate the building of all those bridges is uh, something that we're being very conscientious with. We will have more challenges, but we're undergoing that internal process right now to find something that checks all those boxes. All right, and now I wanted to talk about educators some more. Oh, there's a lot of things in the chat. I'm not looking at the chat as I, as I speak. I don't know if usually we have questions throughout or to the end. Um, however you usually do it, but if you've got questions, please unmute your mic because I'm really not looking at the um, chat, but I just saw there was 10 up there. Okay, so uh, if there's no questions, I'll keep going. As Christine mentioned, I started my work at the NNCO uh, doing a lot of education and outreach work, and that's what I was doing at Georgia Tech as well. And I entitled this slide doing the work to build bridges because I think that engaging with educators from our office's perspective has been one of the most difficult things we've been doing. And I mentioned that there was the brand new goal in the 2021 strategy, engage the public and expand the nanotechnology workforce. That's not to say that the NNCO had not been working in that space before. Uh, we'd been working in that space under a uh, the broader goal of supporting infrastructure, and that was interpreted as both physical and cyber as well as human infrastructure. But I think having this new goal uh, just brought more attention to the need for this skilled uh, workforce. And as I said, we've been playing the long game when it comes to engaging with educators. Primarily, I'm talking about K through 14, so K through 12 and community and technical colleges in particular. Um, and while with the challenges, it was all about coming up with a topic that would motivate uh, various communities to help us build these bridges. But when it comes to educators, they're very busy already. They're teaching to their standards. They have their curriculums. They have their students. And so what we found from this office is we have to do a lot more work to uh, build that bridge to them from listening to what they need and, and so to speak, where that bridge needs to go without expecting them to do a lot of the heavy lifting because they have a lot to already lift. So when it came comes to this bridge in particular, uh, we have found that uh, by highlighting other educators and the programs that other educators have going on and letting teachers talk to teachers or teacher introducing lessons that teachers have developed or highlighting the various programs that are successful has been the best way to slowly build that uh, bridge. And it's not because there aren't a lot of interested, motivated, really hardworking teachers out there. It's because they got other things to do. And so one of the activities that we've been, the office has been doing for about a year now is the Nano Educators Quarterly Forum. Every four times a year, and after school is when we uh, meet, which means it's late on the East Coast so that we can get West Coast teachers as well. And ordinarily, we have a teacher talk to the uh, community. And this one that we have on April 26th is actually a little different. It's part of a two-part series. We had in February a middle school teacher talk about how she integrates nanotechnology and climate change into her science classroom. And the teachers, from talking to them, asked for someone at the uh, university level to kind of talk about the new uh, 
uh, research happening in nanotechnology and climate change, because ordinarily it is educators talking to educators, but we listened and we found them someone to speak at the level of research. And I think that's good for giving them ideas and how to excite their students. So bridge building, ideally you've got people from either shore, you know, coming together for something, but I found with educators, it's really all about doing a lot of it for them so that they can easily cross that bridge when they need to, because they are very, very busy. Now I'm going to talk about another way that we connect our various communities of, and that is through uh, what we have are these communities of interest. And while they all are about nanotechnology, they're sort of more application specific. Uh, we have these interest groups to foster discussion and stakeholder engagement and to help kind of develop activities focused on specific topics. And for anyone who uh, is familiar with the, the NNI and the NNCO, we used to have something called nanotechnology signature initiatives, but also as a part of that strategic plan and an attempt to be more agile, we've changed them to communities of uh, research, which are um, kind of a more flexible way to rapidly create or retire a topic area that has a lot of interest. So right now we have four of these uh, communities of interest that we're helping to coordinate in the office, one around water, one around sensors, one around nanoplastics, and then one on databases and informatics. And I'm gonna talk more specifically about sensors and uh, nanoplastics as two communities of interest that have really been working to build different types of uh, connections to different um, sectors and, di and different interest groups. So the first one I'm going to talk about is our nanoplastics, micro nanoplastics interest group, which is uh, a real hot topic right now. There is a lot of different agencies that are interested in our interest group um, and the problems, the issues with nanoplastics and microplastics, that is a global problem. And so uh, we have been working to connect uh, the example I have here is that uh, right now the nanoplastics interest group is being led by a, a, mem a, a gentleman from the FDA uh, with 15 different agencies that are participating in our various meetings. And it was through uh, the State Department with the nanoplastics interest group proposed to APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, uh, a workshop on nanoplastics. And so it was co-sponsored with Chile, Chinese Taipei, Thailand, and Korea. And the NNCO, through the Nanoplastics Interest Group, um, did a lot to help organize the meeting, uh, to, uh, to create the organizing committee, to find chairs for the workshop, as well as to populate and develop several of the sessions. So working with that uh, global uh, group, economic cooperation group, APEC, and with those other countries in order to develop this uh, workshop. And the goal of it was to share best practices, leverage scientific resources and mitigation of efforts and to develop an international community around this problem, uh, which is basically what the NNCO does at the federal level and now at the global level as well. And there is a final report that's available as well as a companion video that demonstrates some collection and characterization technologies uh, posted on their webpage. So this was an example of us building that global bridge. And then uh, the other in, uh, community of interest was is the uh, nano sensors. And this uh, originally was a signature initiative around sensors for nanotechnology and nanotechnology for uh, sensors. And now it is this community of interest, but I wanted to highlight uh, some of the efforts from this group in particular to really connect with uh, the commercialization uh, sector and to build a path for the commercialization of nanotechnology enabled sensors. And this community has hosted webinars and workshops. And um, right now its focus is primarily on uh, sensors for applications in human health, in water and food and agriculture, although right now we are listening to our federal community and determining uh, you know, where we're going to go moving forward. 
And I've already mentioned spanning at the global level, but also, you know, local and regional end users that are both fed and non-fed, connecting with entrepreneurs, connecting basic researchers with the ones that are more inclined into going into commercialization. Uh, so that's a lot of different areas that are connected through this uh, workshop. And then the workshop report is uh, posted on our website, Finding Better Paths to Products. And this was from 2017. And it consisted of members from federal agencies, as well as academic stakeholders and entrepreneurs to kind of survey the ecosystem and uh, discussing important issues related to manufacturing, fabrication, testing, and uh, performance. And literally this morning, we just had a feds only nanosensors meeting, again, talking about commercialization and uh, next steps. And again, next steps were bringing in people from the broader community in order to talk more about moving forward with uh, sensor commercialization. So always about expanding the audience, expanding the speakers and the uh, stakeholders at the table. Okay. Now, so that was our communities of interest. Now I wanna move to another goal of the NNI, which is responsible development. Um, this goal, has been around since the NNI started. And it's all about understanding potential environmental health and safety implications of nanotechnology. Uh, it also, from the beginning, the NNI was uh, looking at the ethical, legal, and societal implications of nanotechnology as well. And I mentioned at the beginning that uh, the nanotechnology, environmental, and health implications NEHI working group falls underneath NSET. So it is a working group that is under the subcommittee for the National Science and Technology Council. And during the most recent strategic plan, responsible development was expanded to not only include EHS and LC, but now we're including uh, issues of uh, inclusion, diversity, equity, and access, as well as responsible conduct of research. And I think that as the image on my slide shows with the uh, triangle, the elements of responsible development underpin all of the other goals of the NNI and really provide a foundation or an infrastructure. I like to refer to it as the EHS infrastructure to safely and responsibly conduct research and develop products that'll drive American prosperity and security. And by adding ideas of responsible conduct and idea or DEIA, uh, it's linked to how research security and open environments must be balanced with the protection of intellectual property and responsible management of US taxpayer dollars, as well as equitable access to resources and inclusive education, training, and funding uh, that, are, that are really key to facilitating uh, the inclusion of historically marginalized communities in these efforts, and really to help build a further foundation of our of our nano EHS knowledge and to help evaluate and mitigate potential risks. Let's see, so this group, NEHI, helped to develop a federal strategy on nano EHS uh, that uh, was a very, uh, this was back in 2011 when this was published this initial strategy and um, it was quite the undertaking from what everything that I've heard, all of the agencies, there were multiple public workshops, one on each of the six core research areas in the uh, strategy in fact. And um, I wanted to point out that our, our government has funded research on an annual basis between about 58 and $77 million and cumulatively almost one and a half billion dollars has gone towards nano EHS uh, research. And right now, uh, NEHI is working on a refresh of the 2011 nano EHS strategy. So similar to our strategic plan, we are going through uh, many of the same uh, steps. Currently, a lot of teams within the federal government working on this refresh strategy. There will be an RFI released uh, this month with a number of questions that have been developed that we wanna get feedback from the uh, broader community. 
and we are going to have a public workshop that'll be hybrid at the end of May uh, to invite uh, comments from uh, anyone we can get to actually attend basically right now one of our major efforts is we're literally working on a, an invite list we want to be really intentional and in expanding to the number of stakeholders who can contribute to uh, this refresh strategy so i welcome any suggestions any of you might have uh, people that we want to make sure where both the rfi and are invited to attend our public workshop and um our teams right now are developing ideas of people to invite to uh, speak at various sessions as we uh, have that public workshop. The second day will be a listening post is the is the term that uh, I guess government people use, but the first day will be kind of to set that groundwork. What has been accomplished related to that first strategic plan and what new questions we need to ask. So again, right now, in real time, trying to uh, figure out all the different people that we need to connect with and hear from for this new strategy. And then I wanted to talk about at the global, well, not even at the level of the US EU. And I should say that right now there, we're, we're talking a lot about expanding that beyond just the EU. But part of the 2011 strategy was recognition that the government needed to hear from stakeholders outside of the US. And so the US EU nanotechnology communities of research were uh, started up and they there are, let me get, where's my, there are seven cores addressing questions about the potential environmental health and safety implications of nanomaterials. Uh, one on characterization, databases and computational modeling for e nano EHS, ecotoxicity, human toxicity, exposure through product life, risk assessment, and risk management and control. And for each of these different uh, core areas, there is a US-based co-chair and an EU-based co-chair. And this is really to facilitate knowledge sharing across these two different uh, regions. It is a platform to provide scientists a way to collaboratively identify and address key research needs and uh, through these community led activities, lots of teleconferences, webinars, publications, and there's always an annual in person meeting. So I'm going to end on uh, one last example that sort of motivated me to, to think more about language when it came to this uh, presentation. And this is uh, activity from the 2018 core meeting that I know Christine is very uh, familiar with. Um, so in previous years, and, and we are working on, <coughs> excuse me, having the next in-person core meeting here in the United States in the fall. But in previous years, there's usually an interactive exercise. And in 2018, there was an exercise around the importance of language and terminology in shaping the development of a shared understanding and advancing uh, you know, progress or how misunderstanding can impede that progress. And so during this activity, each of those six, or excuse me, seven core research areas devoted a portion of their uh, time together to consider a group, uh, a list of words and phrases uh, that the workshop as a whole had identified at the start that could have uh, different, very nuanced meanings depending upon where you were from uh, and what your discipline, disciplinary background was. I wish I'd been there for this. Uh, I, I think this must have been a really interesting conversation. And I included, so I have some of the words here that they discussed exposure, risk, advanced materials. I would love to hear how different people talk about advanced materials, governance, and ecologically relevant. And what they found was, in general, actually, the meaning of those phrases uh, or the, the, the nuanced definition or, or, I guess, connotation of these, these different phrases, how they were interpreted had more to do with someone's scientific discipline than whether they were from the U.S. or the U., except for uh, governance, which is not that uh, surprising. I think that the U.S. and the EU definitely have uh, different ideas in their head when it comes to governance. I would add harmonization on this list. I don't know if that was on the initial list, but that's another one that I have found uh, moving into this new role. 
since this past summer. So I, I think that that really is a great exercise when you are dealing with people from so many different points of view to even just set the baseline of what you were talking about. And I was actually uh, talking to the current director yesterday about this uh, presentation that I was working on. And he said that from his background and working with, from his background in engineering and working with chemists, substrate was a term that they had to actually figure out what each of them were talking about before they could really effectively collaborate. Because even something like substrate uh, was a term that had slightly different meetings depending on your disciplinary background. And uh, so when I was, so I wanted to end on this because when I was preparing for this presentation, I started to think a lot about uh, the language that we use, mostly because I think I understand what you mean by spanning, but I would love to hear more about what you mean by surfacing. Because that one I've been, I, that's been rolling around in my, my head uh, when I was preparing for all of this. Um, but I think of nanotechnology as a really powerful word, actually. And I think that is where the power of nanotechnology lies, actually, in the phrase itself, because it allows people from so many different disciplines and perspectives and communities to find each other as they approach the same problem from different directions. That how else would a dermatologist find a material scientist to create a solution to deal with diabetic ulcers, for example? But if they know that they're both working at the nanoscale, nanotechnology is that phrase that they can use to find each other. So words and the, the, how we think about them is so important. And so, as I said, I've been thinking about that a lot because I think I understood spanning. That's why I used the bridge analogy so much throughout my presentation. I hope I got that one right. But I am kind of curious, and, and, and we can end on this actually, is, is what was meant by uh, surfacing? I don't know if it meant identifying areas of opportunity that are just below the surface that we can help uh, bring about. I keep thinking about the mer people popping up in The Little Mermaid with the surfacing. Uh, are there, you know, where where are the places that are ripe to build those bridges? And are we talking about, you know, different areas based on discipline or sector or culture, region, policy, and then also just the practical barriers of how do you surface something, an opportunity when you're dealing across the US or across the world with space and time, because that is a major practical barrier to creating these uh, bridges. So I thought of surfacing as like an awareness of where a bridge could go, but I would love to hear more from all of you. And I think with that, follow the NNI on our various social media channels, please. And thank you, any questions? Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, and I will just uh, speak to the surface thing really quick before seeding the rest of the time for any questions. Um, so uh, Christine Glauber actually added that. To, I, I think I had just had spanning in the title and she said surfacing. And so we talked about it and it's in part borrowed from um, some language that we recognize from the toolbox dialogue initiative, which is a, a, a initiative run out of Michigan State University um, based in philosophy, but also but quite applied to teams. Um, they also worked on some of the NNCO meetings with us actually a little bit. And it is a nod to the fact that some boundaries we know we need to span and then others, to your point, we might not have the awareness. So for example, like if I, as an environmental engineer, I'm talking to a historian, I probably see that there's a boundary we need to span. But in your example of the two people using substrate differently, that probably had to be surfaced because you first go in thinking like, oh, that's really, that's neighbors. We must be saying the same thing. So just the recognition that some boundaries we have to span, we might go in not even knowing that there's spanning that needs to happen. Uh, thank you so much for that. If anybody has questions, um, please go ahead and uh, and pose those. I'm looking and at I, the chat now and I'm seeing banana pudding. <laughs> and I can appreciate a pun, so thank you. Yeah, I think we converged on a potential um, actual competition for what the dessert should be for Nano Day. So it's a, a 
dessert bonanza competition oh. with puns. Um, while people might be thinking of their thoughts, I wanted to point out that um, one thing we do usually is uh, two weeks after the webinar, we often have a reading and discussion club for anyone who's available at the same time to come um, and just talk in a much more informal, not recorded open way. Um, and inspired by Dr. Spadola's talk um, next, uh, so two Tuesdays from now, um, at the same hour, we'll dig into this I2 Insights blog post um, that is about power. I was really taken by um, your talk about, you know, not having funding, but having to use soft power to align. Um, that's incredibly, you know, high impact. So this is a um, by Gabrielle Bammer, the uh, the creator of the I2 Insights repository herself. Um, and it's called Under uh, Understanding Diversity Primer, um, number four, power. So um, we will come back together to read that and maybe talk more about what we learned from Dr. Spadola. Um, yes. Uh, hey, y'all. Shana here. Um, thank you, Quinn. Uh, if, you're, if you're willing to share, could you tell us about maybe some like challenges and pushback from, I mean, there's just so many partners involved. I feel like there must be some people like resisting um, the coordinating office. Um, if you're willing to share maybe a couple examples uh, of of pushback and, and ways that you guys have worked through that. So I became deputy director in August and we have a new director who started in September. So uh, either I'm really happy because I don't have a specific example for you yet that like from the trenches from me that I, I can talk about. I will say that um, everybody's busy. Like I was saying about building that bridge for educators, all of the um, people uh, from all the different agencies that participate, they all have day jobs on top of doing all of this. So it's never pushback about what's being done it's always and that's where the soft power and the fact that having an office is so valuable it's how can we as the nnco help facilitate these ideas and these goals that they now have and these different activities they want to develop in in um, service of these goals in a way that allows the the feds to to you know share participate uh, without too much of a burden, because as I said, they all have day jobs, but that's, you know, I'm pretty new at this. So I don't know. And I, I don't know if the former leadership would, I doubt very much they'd give you anything juicy because it's a recorded webinar, but uh, they might be able to give you other examples. But I think it really has to do with finite time and effort that people have more so than activities themselves. Mm -hmm. So, and that's why, you know, trying to make the burden as light as possible is, is one way of, of addressing that. So that makes sense completely. Thank you. Hi, Quinn. Uh, my name is Jeremy Steinbacher. I was a AAAS fellow who interviewed uh, in the spring of 2018. I think maybe we met oh, during my interview. Uh, maybe because or I left right that summer of 2018. So it might've been just as I was heading out the door. You interviewed for the NNCO? Uh, yeah. And anyway, I, I ended up in the labs and personnel office in DOD, uh, which like yours is really like a policy coordinating office. And I did a, uh, a lot of the lab to market uh, subcommittee work of the NSTC. Great. So I know, uh, and I can commiserate with you of how, you know, it's everybody just sort of getting picked to go to these meetings and try to speak for entire federal agencies. And it's, um, I don't, I don't really have anything uh, thoughtful to add other than just to say, yeah, it's really difficult, um, but it can't, when it works and everybody's on board, it can be really powerful. And, and absolutely uh, this idea of um, like servicing the boundaries, right? Everybody has all these different missions. Um, and especially being at DOD, we're much different than many of the other uh, agencies. So our mission, uh, you know, very specific mission-driven focus was always um, a little bit of a different perspective from many of the other folks. So 
talking about those and getting them out in the open is absolutely uh, really important. Thank you. Totally concur. We probably have time for a final question. It's always tough to be challenged to fit it into a certain amount of time, especially in this group of like people who try to facilitate well. I have another, if you're willing. Um, I I love the idea of a, a challenge, like a priority topic um, in, in a discrete amount of time to kind of get everybody on board. Like what was the duration of, of the last challenge and kind of like what's the plan for the, the next set of challenges? So the, the Nano for Earth challenge is is ongoing. Okay. Uh, but the, the goal of the challenge is to, it's very short. It's four to five years. We would like to see an impact to, um, we had our public workshop from there, we've identified four areas of, um, you know, like carbon capture, um, energy storage. Ooh, let's see if I can remember all carbon capture, energy storage, sort of improving what we already have. So improved catalysts, improved lubricants, improved coatings. And um, how sad is this that the fourth one has fallen out of my head right now? Uh, it'll probably come to me as soon as I leave this meeting. So we've got these four areas that we identified through that public workshop, and then we're moving, going to move each four, each of those along uh, with roundtable discussions, trying to have an impact in that very short four to five uh, year range of identifying something, shining a light on it, helping get it, you know, through the valley of death to uh, something that end users can uh, uh, take advantage of in terms of addressing climate change. That will most likely be the trend for any future challenges as well. Uh, the point is to be agile and to uh, have short burst focus on things, but it's still the government. So a short is on the, and, and everybody keeps talking about four or five years is incredibly short for this. But I think by, by framing it that way, it helps hopefully to keep that motivation going. So, but yeah, if you're interested in more, Nano for Earth is, is ongoing right now for the next few years. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Well, that perfectly landed us right at the top of the hour. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Spadola, for joining us. Uh, that was really wonderful to hear, and I learned a lot. Um, and thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, and this will be posted in um, probably a, a couple of weeks in our archives. So. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye.